Run. Right, so hope this finds you well as always. And it's now time for the latest update from the machine shop, where we're up to, what we're on with, and the various bits and pieces that have been going through the shop in the last week. Enjoy. Right, and so here we are with the worm gear that Barry's cutting for the cylinder boring gear. Now, he's made an incredible amount of progress here. There's quite a lot to go through. And I'll be honest, from watching his progress, I've learned an awful lot about machining worm gears, and I've realised there's far more involved in it than I, real and I realised. Right, so the first thing Barry's doing is he's roughing out the tooth profile. Uh, the reason he's not cutting the full tooth profile in one go is, first of all, because he hasn't made up his tooling to do it yet, and the second, because it involves removing so much metal that the degree of engagement you'd have with the tool and the work will probably lead to it chattering. So instead, what he's doing is he's simply roughing out the tooth form, and he's also, to be honest, using this to check the dividing setup as well. So he's gone round and cut, the, it's just a parallel groove that he's cut that to start the formation of the profile. But it's not just that he's had to do. If you look at this, you'll also see, you can see it clearest at the top, you'll see the outside of the gear has a radius machined into it. So his first job was to actually machine that radius before he went any further. Now he's done all of this with a fly cutter held in the nose, oh sorry, held in the spindle of the milling machine. So first of all, to cut the radius, he simply, and, I, and by saying simply, I'll be honest, I'm doing the man a disservice. There's an incredible amount of setup work and measurement gone into this. What he ended up doing was he um, set the fly cutter, centered the spindle of the milling machine on the um, gear, so the centre the cent line of the spindle is exactly in the middle of the gear blank. And he then put his fly cutter in, started it spinning, fed it in until it was the correct depth. And then by rotating the rotary table, he would then wind it round and round and round, cut the radius, okay? He had in turn then made up a gauge that he could then, so he could then offer the gear blank up to a gauge which modelled the worm shaft but it modelled the worm shaft as if all of the teeth the, the the outer sort of teeth of the worm if you will what weren't there it's the inner core diameter because this is what you've got to think about with gear cutting you're not cutting what you're cutting is something that that will fit into okay so those grooves they're the grooves that eventually, and if I, I drop this, it's going to kill me. They are the grooves that eventually the worm will fit into. And so this radius here will match the inner diameter of the worm. So what Barry's solution was very simple, is he could get in and measure that inner diameter. So he simply made himself a dummy shaft which modelled that in the diameter. And so to test his radius was right, he could then offer the gear up to that inner shaft, sat in the mountings it was sitting, and the two matched. So he knew that radius was right, so at this point it was then back onto the machine. Now this is where another little complication comes in, because that worm gear, as you will see, is slightly helical. To do that, he's had to tilt the head of the milling machine slightly vertically. So instead of being absolutely vertical, it's tilted slightly like that. And so that's then giving him the helical angle. And so then he's going to go around and cut all those divisions. He also, as I said, he used this as an opportunity just to check the dividing setup was right. And it was. It matched absolutely perfectly within a couple of thou, which, considering the tool had been out of the holder two or three times to regrind, is actually very impressive indeed. So the next job he's done is he's modified his roughing tool and he's ground it down, thinned it down. And so he'll now make another pass and cut each of these teeth deeper because again remember you're making a gap that that profile must fit into so he's cut it wider which is for the root of the worm and then to cut right to the bottom where this uh the, where the bit that my finger's sitting on will run he's had to cut it he's going to cut it far narrower so his next job is to cut all of those divisions again but with an arrow cutter and deeper and so then the last job will be to profile the sides of these parallel grooves to match that and he freely admitted to me today he's not quite sure what tool he's going to use to do that it might be high speed steel he might have to grind it out of a carbide tip tool 
if high speed steel won't stand up to it so there we go i hope that's made sense i think i've i'll be honest watching barry doing this job i'm learning something every minute watching him it's been absolutely fantastic to see this job coming together and it's uh, it looks it's one of these things it looks ludicrously simple and then when you start uh getting into it and start watching the man doing the job you suddenly realize that it's actually incredibly convoluted so I've as I said I've really enjoyed watching Barry doing this. I've learned something every minute, and I hope this will be the latest update. Hopefully, the next time I show this, we'll have those grooves cut to depth and maybe even a tooth profile on them with a bit of luck. So he's getting on with it, and it's um, proving to be quite challenging. Right here, we've got the safety valves of the J27, which have been reported as passing, and so have come to us for a gentle. Um, sorting out now we haven't got the whole safety valves here as i'm sure you'll realize what we've got is the base and the valve itself we haven't got the body nor the spring or any of the internal gubbins but these are the two critical parts of the safety valves because what we're aiming to do is that on the valve you have a skirt here around the outside of the valve and you have the base here and what you're trying to do is set a clearance between that skirt and the base to get the valve to work properly that is it'll lift but then as the pressure falls, it will close with that sharp pop characteristic of a Ross pattern safety valve. So what we've, what you, the way you do that is you set a distance from the valve face itself here to the edge of the skirt, and then from the other valve face here to the base. Now, you simply measure those in the micrometer and then machine them accordingly to set them within a series of tolerances. You have these tolerances. These tolerances are provided on a series of standard drawings we do use. This one is for the valve. You can see the range there. And then also similar drawing for the... Get out of it. Similar drawing for the base uh, gives you the that tolerance band again. Now I always try to get them, when machining them, I always try to get them in the high end of the tolerance and so then they've got uh, the maximum amount of wear possible in their life. So those have been machined and then, well, only one of the valves has been machined, everything else is found absolutely fine. And then the uh, base and the valve have been given a good lap together. That is, they've had a dose of lapping paste, which is a mixture of grease and carborundum grinding paste has been put onto the face there and then the two lap together to get them at, to get them sitting together truly you're not aiming to get them absolutely flat you won't but what you're trying to do is get the two faces to mate together nicely so they'll seal properly so there's another quick little job that's been done those can now be reassembled by chris henwood and then that's the j27 pretty much all ready for it going on its summer holidays. So there we go, another job done. Another job that's come in is a request for Brian, and it's these parts which are out of the battery isolation switch on the Drury shunter. They're basically a series of bolts that act as terminals, and what's happened is on some of them, as you can see, the thread on the bolt is decidedly past its best. So we've been asked for two that size, to that size we've only got one of them as a sample i'm not quite sure and then eight of these half nuts to match so there's another quick little job for brian should keep him out of trouble in the next couple of days and so hopefully we'll have a look back at that uh and see how he's got on with it right. and so there we go just as predicted brian's risen to the occasion and done his usual excellent work as i said these are out of the battery isolated switch on the Drury shunter, the effect lights terminal posts. So we've got the casing of the switch there so Brian could have it to check they actually fitted where they're supposed to. And so that's another job um, expertly and skillfully rattled off. So there we go, that's another bit done. So anyway, folks, that's about it for this week. Apologies for the um, slight delay in uploading the video. Um, you just can't get the staff, you know, the cameramen these days. So anyway, hope you found it educationally informative as always. Now take care and I'll see you around.